Good afternoon, everyone. Kevin Lawrence here, also known as Coach Kevin to many of you, Coach K, all kinds of things that I get called. Um, today, I'm going to share with you, and we're going to talk about my, my newest book, Your Oxygen Mask First, and going to give you a walkthrough of it so you can understand the principles and start to see how it can relate to you and the people that you work with. Going to jump right into it. The, the initial thing that's, that's important to understand here is, is that the premise is about learning about ourselves and how we can help ourselves and our team. Uh, I want to take you back to August 16th, 1977. That was a very, very important day in my, in my history. Uh, I was a young boy and we were doing a family road trip around North America, all the way around, uh, down through California and back up through the middle of North America, through the US. We just crossed the border back into Canada and that whole trip, we've been listening to uh, eight tracks. And for those of you that don't remember eight tracks, they're big fat cassette tapes you would stick in the dash of your vehicle and listen to music. And we had four that I remember. Kenny Rogers, uh, ABBA, uh, Neil Diamond, and Elvis Presley. And I can pretty well guarantee any of the songs that you would listen to back then from those four, I know word by word each and every song. So as we're driving back and we cross the border into Canada, we're about 10 minutes from our house and there's this big accident on the bridge. So we're sitting and waiting. Uh, and so instead of the eight tracks, we actually turned back on the radio to our local radio station. And it turned out to be um, an announcement that came on that was sort of shattering and shocking to our family. And again, this is on August 16th. And the news was, is that the king of rock and roll was dead. Elvis Presley had died that day. And for a lot of people, that was tragic. But for us, it was, it was beyond tragic because in our family, we had worshipped Elvis. Literally, literally worshipped Elvis. And this picture that I'll share with you here was actually hanging up in our dining room. Imagine this identical picture of, of Elvis, which is like the Hawaii version of Elvis, with, um, you know, framed with the velvet wallpaper in the background. And that's what we grew up with as, as, as kids. And my parents loved Elvis and he was a big, big part of our life. But the reason that day impacted me so much is that, that with him, in my mind, he had it all. He was rich, he was famous, he had a mansion, he had his own airplane, he had a wonderful daughter, beautiful wife, everything seemed to look amazing. And as a seven-year-old child, I was questioning myself, like, how would somebody who had it all just want to give it away? And it made no sense to me whatsoever. And it really impacted me, and I, and I did, obviously didn't realize it, but it really impacted me and made me curious because we didn't have a lot. We were, we were kind of, you know, scraping by and, and trying to make a decent life. We didn't have what he did. And why would he choose to pretty well destroy himself when when he had so much more than us, didn't make sense. So it made me very, very curious. And then throughout my life, there was other big impactful events. This one, April 8th, 1994, you could try and guess, but it was Kurt Cobain, amazing musician who had a huge impact on the world. June 25th, 09, Michael Jackson. July 23rd, 2011, Amy Winehouse. August 11th, 2014, the great, great comedian, Robin Williams. This one really messed me up. This is where I really started to understand things more because I judged him. You know, I, made, I said things about him after he, after he ended his own life that, that I actually regret because I didn't understand. I didn't get the pain that these people were in such that ending their life to them, not truth, but to them seemed like a logical option. 2016. Prince, another amazing, amazing addition. And then the last couple of weeks really, really blew me away. June 5th, Kate Spade, which many of you heard about, again, had achieved everything. And of course, as I'm out over the weekend, all I do is see women with Kate Spade bags everywhere we go. So this woman who had a huge impact on women in handbags and fashion, again, life was just not good enough for her or too much for her. And then Anthony Bourdain, another one who I love this guy. He's a bit of a rebellious character on the sort of the, the potentially snobby and snooty, uh, you know, uh, food world and chef world. And he has got a real basic, lively exploration into the craziest and most amazing foods around the world. So there's a lot of these people who, in our mind, in, in the Western view of things, have it all, yet somehow they decide it's, life is not worth living. And it's this been obsession of mine to figure out this dream and why does it become a nightmare? Because by other people's standards, they have this amazing, amazing experience. This quote from Neil Young kind of really hit home. 
My, my, hey, hey, rock and roll is here to stay. Better burn out than to fade away. And you know, if it was just rock stars and musicians, we could justify, hey, that's the rock and roll lifestyle. But the truth is, there's also the same dark side to the business world as well. Not just the super famous and, and, and super well-known people of our world. Challenge is, it's a bit of a secret. People don't talk about it. Because it's not cool to talk about these things. It's not, doesn't make your company's brand stronger. It doesn't help you to grow revenues, profits, or customer loyalty by talking about the struggles that the leaders face in the business. But let me tell you, leaders face massive, massive struggles, particularly the most high performing leaders. Just like the famous people I've shared, they are the most high performing in what they're doing. People in a normal realm have challenges, but people that play at the extremes generally have more extreme challenges. So there's this thing called the dichotomy of success. And if you look at this, and if you look at these amazing people, the challenges that they face are equally as amazing. So the past 12 months, I've got a CEO I worked with, a brilliant, very successful CEO, but couldn't actually physically walk and missed an advisory board meeting because they were in the emergency room instead. You would never guess it by meeting this person, strong, resilient, charismatic, but they were so messed up and the stress just debilitated them. Another one started yelling and screaming and threatening a coworker in the middle of a meeting of 25 people. This was an A++ executive, like as good as it gets, and they just lost it. Another CEO lost their ability to think strategically while they were in a process of selling their business. It was just so hard on their brain and the stress was just compounding them from multiple different places that literally brain function dropped dramatically. I've got another one that I work with that after they sold their business had a whole other experience of stress and strain that really debilitated them. Another A++ executive resigned. This woman was one of the best executives I've ever worked with. They were spectacular, impeccable on doing everything they said. But they finally just quit and ran away from the business because they couldn't handle it anymore. It was just too much pressure and that was the only solution they could see. Another one became so negative and lost belief in their business, they became a horrible, toxic leader, <laughs> and they were the CEO. Again, these are smart, strong people who get themselves in bad situations. This is a text I got from a client that I've been working with for 15 years. I got this uh, six months ago, and it was these exact words, I took it out of the text. But basically, I called this person up and said, hey, what's up? Because I'd never received this kind of text before. And they said, I don't know, but my brain's really messed up and I'm drinking a lot. And for this person to say that, that meant, you know, they, this is a person who always drinks a little bit, but they were, they were trying to fix their anxiety with massive amounts of drinking. And in all these cases, there was one similar root cause. It's not rocket science, but it's very, very predictable. Hundreds more examples I can share with you. We can look at what happened to the CEO of Uber. Was he a bad guy? I actually don't know, I don't know him. But he did display the behavior of someone who's gone way too hard for way too long and cooked and destroyed himself. Bill, uh, Bill Gates, um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, Steve Jobs, you know, in a conversation that he had had with Jim Collins, they talked about the stress of him doing what he had done in his work. You know, and one of the things that he had said is that for him, one of the, the, Steve Jobs believes that some of the seeds of his own illness and his cancer were placed during that crazy time when he came back into Apple and it was absolutely incre incredibly intense for him. Now, those were Steve Jobs' words. So, but the point is, this is just business and it's not brain surgery, right? Nobody dies. That might be for the rock stars, but, but that's actually not true. You know, there are executives who end up taking their lives. One happened in a company that I worked with last year. It's very sad and, and unfortunate but it does really hurt people and destroy people, not just the famous people. And that's part of why I'm so passionate about it. So we go back to the question, why does some of these high performers thrive while others end up living a nightmare? Why does it crush some where others go on to do amazing things and, and are kind of unscarred in the process? Truly the similar cause is this, and this picture of the camel basically uh, sums it. And it's not that the straw broke the camel's back. It's really that they, their commitment exceeded their capability. If this is their capability, high-performing people generally overcommit, and most of the times it works. But sooner or later, and sometimes, 
They just can't bridge that gap and it crushes them. And in many ways, people end up succumbing to their own success. Because they're so successful and they take on more, they take on too much and essentially smother themselves. And when this happens, all these people are usually terrified. Now, people aren't going to talk about it, and I don't blame them. But usually what ends up happening, because they're so strong and so resilient, it takes a brick wall to stop them. But usually it's their brain, their spouse, their doctor, their lawyer, their banker, their accountant, or their board that in some way has given them a wake-up call or, or, or read them a riot act and just said, hey, buddy, or hey, lady, this ain't going to work anymore. And for many of them, my experience is, it's more likely to be the first one and the brain. Because most high performers are quite comfortable dealing with all of those other issues. That's sort of in the normal realm of what they do. But the brain, and when that starts to go, and you know, when they start to get not feel good, when they start to have panic attacks or shut down or not think clearly, that's often when it really, really gets their attention. Here's, here's a quote. I, I wrote a blog last week about um, Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain because that really impacted me and uh, it was just fits right into the kind of work that I'm doing. Here's a quote from a CEO that I helped recently. I'm not going to say anything about them, but this is their quote. Great post. I'll never forget being in that dark place. I thought I would never get out. You just want it to stop and think of stupid ways to make that happen. I'm really thankful you helped me and are opening up communication about it for others. Now you can read whatever you want into that post, but this is a badass, amazing CEO, amazing CEO. And all the qualities you would want in a CEO, this person has it. But he was in a deep, 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 dark place. And of course, that didn't come out in the initial conversation, but we got him back on strong ground and now amazing ground. But what I want you to get is that this business of growing companies, it slowly destroys you or it makes you stronger. And what I want to share with you is tools to help you so you can be the person that gets stronger and stronger. So the cause, you know, and it's a little cheesy, but it's, it's the title of the book and what it's about, is that people don't put their oxygen mask on first. They generally don't take good enough care of themselves. And they've got away with it for so many years that they can handle it in many times in the past until finally once or twice they get a few too many big burdens and it shuts them down. So the idea is about putting yourself first. And, and conventional wisdom tells us, no, 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 don't do that. That makes you a bad person. That makes you selfish or self-centered or just somebody that people don't want to be associated with. And, and I want to help dispel that myth and say that's actually not what it's about. And, and putting yourself first, you know, this is what people say. You should be selfless. Put others first. You should be a servant leader. I love the, this beautiful concept of servant leadership. It sounds wonderful but it's lethal if you're a highly committed, high-performing leader. So you gotta put yourself first. Your own growth, if you wanna keep growing in the game and getting better, you gotta put your own growth first. Your own health first. If you're not strong and resilient health-wise, your brain starts to fade, your energy fades, and you, you can't do great things. Your own learning first, your think time first, your inspiration first, your strength first. Of course, your oxygen mask first. You have to take time and commit to yourself, otherwise it, it's really gonna hurt seriously sooner or later, and often when you don't expect it. So the book, Your Oxygen Mask First, which you're obviously aware of, the principle that I look at it from a business point of view, if we can't get leaders to keep on scaling and getting stronger, the company will get stuck and it won't grow. So it's up to us to be strong and resilient if we want our companies to succeed. And here's a model that, that we use in, in, in my firm, the way I think about things. To be really successful, you need these three things. You need stronger leaders, leaders that continually can handle more. You need a better strategy, continually refining it so that you can take better care of your customers and dominate in the market. And then you need a more capable CEO. There's a box specifically for the CEO because the CEO sets the pace and the tone of the organization. And you can have really strong leaders, but if the CEO fades along the way, the organization will start to slow down and eventually die. And for all of these, the growth of the, particularly the leaders and the CEO, it's really about continually doubling your capability, doubling what you know and who you know and your own resilience. And this book, a lot of this book is about your resilience. I touch on some of the other ones, but the strength of the individual leader and CEO to me is the most important thing. The other things you can figure out, but if you don't have that enduring strength, um, it's pretty challenging. 
So um, it's going to skip through this. So if you want to go in really in my purpose and what I'm about, just for a second, you know, is I want to help CEOs and leaders have it all, both success in business and a rewarding life. And usually it's fairly easy to have success in business. A lot of self, self sacrifice, hard work that can be done. It's fairly easy to have a rewarding life. You know, get, get a very simple, basic nine to five job without a lot of pressure. You've got lots of time to think about what you're doing on the evenings and the weekends. But the magic of having both, and that's what everything I look at doing is about. Stronger in the business and have a great life. To me, that's what a, what a real win is like. And as, as you know, I've shared with a few of you, but my, my goal is to impact a million leaders a month and to help a million leaders get the insights of what really works for high performers versus the conventional junk that I think is sometimes pretty dangerous. So how does that dream not turn into a nightmare? I'll share a story with you. Nigel has been a client of mine for more than 15 years. He's got a company called AquaGuard Spill Response. They, clean, they manufacture this equipment for cleaning up oil spills around the world. Uh, he's built a, a great company. And when I first met him though, things weren't going so well. Here's a list of his accomplishments. I mean, he has accomplishments like you wouldn't believe, right? All kinds of, of, of awards and you know, he won this great rule breaker award in 2016, which I love because he's very much a rule breaker and a little bit of rebel. Done amazing charity work around the world. I mean, it's, it's the resume of someone that many of us would aspire to, to be like, great guy. But when I first met him, it wasn't so great. And, and he actually was actually afraid to put his hand on the doorknob of his business to go inside when I first met him. Literally, he felt like he was almost getting electrocuted every time he did it. He absolutely hated it and couldn't stand it. And he was really stuck. He didn't know what to do. Interestingly, his accountant, who had been helping him along the way, referred him to me because the accountant said, I don't know what to do with this guy. He's a mess. He's a really good guy, but I just don't know what to do. And that's how we ended up first getting connected. His solution was this. He was literally going to go sell T-shirts on the beach in Tahiti. That was his solution. He'd already done more than well in his business. He had, he had set himself up financially. He was going to go down there and just have an easy laid back job and basically walk away from his business, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But what we started doing is instead of walking on the beach, we walked at the beach in Vancouver and we would start walking and hiking the mountains and walking around the seawall of Vancouver. And initially we would do it every month for a half a day, just walking and talking and working out his thing. Now, Nigel's the kind of guy that can't sit still. He's an amazing guy but sitting in a room will drive him crazy. So we would walk and talk and walk and talk. And I don't know how many miles we've put on, but over probably, oh, I, I'd be guessing actually, but easily a thousand that we've walked and worked out all of his challenges. And he, if you go through all the principles in the book, we have worked through every single one of those principles and he's made himself continually stronger and stronger. So his wheel of resilience is pretty good. Not perfect, but, 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 but quite good. And, and now he's actually gone off, written his own book, which you can see here called take that leap. If you want to read some crazy adventures of an entrepreneur at a young age, you know, including hanging out of a helicopter in Ecuador, getting shot at while he's trying to take pictures of all the oil spills there. I mean, just amazing, crazy stories that he has as he built his business over the years. But for him, what he has really got is now that he's dialed everything in his life and it's not rocket science. You just work on these different habits one at a time, and they always get better if you put energy into them. Um, but now he wants to go and help more people do the same, because for a lot of entrepreneurs and, and CEOs, you know, their, their lives can get pretty messy in the process of, of doing something great. So he's a great example of if you put the work in, it'll always get better. And he has had some of the most extreme situations you can imagine. Think of the craziest things you've had to deal with, and his will be at a similar level, potentially, um, Potentially crazier. Don't want to compare, but he's some pretty crazy stuff he's dealt with. So one of the other root causes is this thing called work-life balance. And it's a principle people love to throw around. And it's total BS. It is the stupidest concept for high achievers. It actually makes you feel worse because you're never going to be balanced. It's impossible to have this work-life balance in the kind of work we do. Yes, in government jobs it's possible, but for what most of us are up to, it's not even achievable and you shouldn't even try. I love this quote. You don't go to the amusement park roller coaster and say, I wanna be balanced. No, you wanna be as unbalanced as possible because that's the thrill of the ride. 
for most of us, if it gets balanced, it gets boring. We want the challenge and the thrill. Now, sometimes it's a bit too much. We'd like it to back off. But it's, it's not about aspiring to balance. That's a losing battle, and it's not even what we want. So here's the theory of work-life balance. Okay, you got your work and you got your life. Two kind of happy parts of your world. Wonderful. And as, as you get more responsibility at work, or maybe you get, um, uh, you know, you get married or, or something more serious in your life, more responsibility. You know, you get another big project at work or it becomes a crazy time. No problem. You're still good. There's lots of room for your life. You get a huge promotion, take on a new territory, and there's some crazy stuff at work. Well, you know, your life sacrifices a bit. You know, you're, 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 you're okay. That's actually not how it works. That's not even a fair or reasonable way to look, look at your life. Here's how it really works. There's this thing called you, yourself in the middle. And, it, and when you're in your teens and earlier in your life, you got these three different things. Everything's pretty darn good. And then you get a, a job and your life starts to expand, no problem. And then more responsibility at work, then you get married, maybe a buy house that you have to take care of. Then you get to the point where you get even more successful at work and then your life and now you have a couple of kids. And you know, yourself is still there but it's getting squished out. And then more work and more life and next thing you know you start practicing that servant leadership or if I just take care of everyone else, I'll be okay, which is idiotic. Next thing you know, you're gone, right? Your work dominates because something big happens. Your life is still there because you're committed to it. And there's this little slice where you have like 0.1% of your energy left for yourself. And your commitment exceeds your capability, just like that picture I showed you of the camel before. And here's the point. If you are running on 0.1% of your oxygen or your best energy, I don't care how good you are. I don't care how tough you are. You're screwed. You are going to pay royally for that, and it's going to hurt. In a matter of time, nobody can sustain on that. So the solution. I, I studied once with this crazy uh, monk, and he taught me how to meditate probably 15 years ago. He was a great meditation teacher and a, uh, a very interesting character, let's just say. But he taught me this. is You can't pour tea from an empty pot. If there's nothing in you, you can't give it. And by nature, I'm a generous person and want to help people and help others. He goes, yeah, but if you just keep helping, you deplete yourself and then you're no good to no one. So it's all about oxygen allocation is the way that I have learned it or passion allocation, however you want to look at it. But you got to start with yourself. And here's how the model works. If you got your work self life, let's just say you need 10% of your oxygen or 10% of your best energy or, or passion units, I call it in the book, to be successful. You figure out what you need, and then you lock that in. And then as work and life expand, it's non-negotiable what you do for yourself. Absolutely non-negotiable. And life and work can get massive, but you still do those things you need so that you are strong and resilient. Now, this is darn hard to do. You know, people at work might not like it sometimes, or your family might not like it sometimes. But if you don't do this, and you want to play a big game, uh, Sooner or later, it's, it's, it's going to bite you and, and probably take you down. So the idea is to figure out what you need, and then everything else comes second. With the intent of being generous and wanting to be able to have more to give. If I go back here, if you, if you only give yourself 1% of your best energy, you will gradually wilt away. And as a result, you'll have almost no energy to give to your work in your life because you'll just be in survival mode. So the book, by the way, I'm going to talk about the book, but there's also the workbook. If you don't have it, uh, you can download it for free. Uh, after you do the assessment, there's a link to get it for free, or you can buy it on Amazon if you want the, the, the pretty printed version. But all the exercises in the book are in that workbook so you can write to your heart's content and think it through. I know lots of people don't like to write in books. The workbook's also designed when we do workshops and when I, when I do speaking engagements as well. So there are 17 habits. People ask why 17? That's just because that's how many there is. I happen to actually like the number 17. But these are basically the habits that cover off 90% of the situations I come up with with high-performing CEOs and leaders. 90% of the challenges or situations or things they need to work on. There's always a few other things, but this covers off the most. So, and as, as Jim Collins says, success is relentless execution of the boring basics. These aren't rocket science. Most of them are actually very, very basic, but we often fail to do them when they matter most, and that's why they become a problem or we don't pay attention to them and that's why they become a blind spot or, or a great growth area. 
So in terms of the self-assessment, you know, we sent you out uh, an, a, a suggestion to do the self-assessment in advance. So this version you can download off the site if you want to do it with a group of people and, and, and you're welcome to take that and use that. The online version is meant for you to do it. So if you haven't done the online version, I would suggest go to this link right now and uh, I will walk you through the assessment as we go through the questions and you can complete them. I'll give it greater context. If you have already done the assessment and you have your results, just have those sitting in front of you and you can take a look at that and, and, and rethink about the scoring that you've done on each as I explain each principle um, a little bit further. What you'll see on the, on the left and center of the screen is samples of what the assessment output looks like and it gives you a view to what your reality is right now. On the left is someone who, who these are just samples that I got have here, is someone who's you know, probably having a bit of a rougher time. The one on the right is someone that's actually in pretty good shape. I'll be really clear, no one's perfect on this, ever. We all have things to work on. Even when we're strong on one, we'll get into situations where we'll get knocked down again. Or we'll be strong on it, but the business will double in size. So what used to be an eight out of 10 actually becomes a five and we have to shore it up even further. And when you do do the assessment, you'll get uh, links to showing you all the videos. So you can watch videos on each of the different principles all of this is designed to have you be able to do it on your own and then share it with your teams and share it with people in your company. Again, I want to impact a million people a month. I'm, there's no way I'm going to do that myself. I've made all these tools to make it easier for you to do it yourself. So if you haven't logged in already, go log into the assessment now, lawrenceandco.com forward slash YOMF dash assessment. As you can see on the screen, you can do it live as, as we go through it. So the first thing to rate yourself on, I mean, zero means, oops, never heard of it. And one means, Man, or sorry, 10 means I'm a master. So the first one, live an amazing life. So how good are you enjoying life in tandem with your achievements in business? So in this principle, we talk about the difference between head success, you know, what feeds the ego and the sense of accomplishment and, you know, winning big, growing a business, achieving awards, performing at a high level, all those things that make us feel really good. It could be making money, all those things. And then heart success. What makes you feel wonderful inside? So if this is the extrinsic reward and the ego, ego, which is fine, we all need that. That's what we're driven people. What is the intrinsic reward and what makes you feel great inside? This could be you know, things that you enjoy around. It could be art that you love doing just for the sake of doing it. Or it could be you know, time you spend with your friends or your family or your hobbies. It doesn't matter. So how good are you at doing both? And many people over-sacrifice to feed the head don't do enough of this, and they end up wildly successful and miserable. So we're trying to achieve that. So how good are you at doing both? Feeding your head and your ego versus your heart and, and, and what makes you feel great inside. Number two, forget work-life balance. We've already talked about this one. And the question here is, do you dedicate enough time and energy, or oxygen, to work, self, and life? You're not gonna be perfect. So for example, during the course of the year normally, I am generally, we'll call it 60, probably 70-ish percent work. And self would be 10 to 15 and life would be 15 to 20, depending on the time of year. I'm coming into the summer where it's different. Work will be 50 or 40 because I take most of my extra time off in summer. Self will be 15 or so and life will be at least 25, 30%. Those, those ratios change. But the point is, how well do you do on this based on what seems right for you? And the major cue on this, the major cue is, is that when you come home and wanna spend time with your family, right, or your friends, do you have lots of great oxygen or great energy to give to them? I know I do when I'm planning interesting things and making interesting things happen. If I've overused up my energy on the other ones, when I'm time with my family and friends, I just kind of show up and I don't have anything great to give uh, because there's nothing left in the tank. So how well do you allocate or spend your, your energy in those different areas? Three, double your resilience. How good are you at making time for the things that build and maintain your resilience? So the way we look at this is about body, mind, and spirit, right? So what are you doing to make time for things and how good are you at doing the things that physically make you strong and energized. 
it's rare to find someone who sustains high performance that has, doesn't have some sort of physical regime to get their body energized and healthy. Obviously, the, the eating side of it is a big side of it too. It's not just exercise. But how, what do you do in terms of making your, your body incredibly strong and reflective? Um, in terms of your mind is the second piece is that with your mind, what happens for a lot of people, it starts to get squirrely. You know, my, my meditation teacher taught me about this thing called monkey mind, where the brain is just squirreling all the time and your thoughts are bouncing into each other. And, and as a result, you're not as clear and focused or insightful as you can be. So what do you do to keep your mind strong and healthy? And it's not just about clear and focused. It's also about having good positive things that go into it that allow you to be optimistic and, and push through things that others might, might be afraid of. Uh, and, and finally, the last one is spirit. And no, as my Irish friend said, it's not spirits. <laughs> it's not mastering the art of drinking. Spirit is the thing. Now, for some people, it might be their faith. For some people, it might be other activities that they do. It might be time in nature. Water. It doesn't matter. What are those things that light you up and almost feed your soul and make you feel strong and resilient inside? So we go back to this. So how good are you at making time for all three things, body, mind, and spirit? By the way, one of the things I really work on when leaders get themselves in trouble and messed up is always this principle, always. Because pretty well guaranteed, no matter what, they have over-sacrificed themselves and got themselves weaker and, and, and more vulnerable to be knocked down by situations. So this is almost an always. So in the chapter, we get into something called resilience rituals, knowing what you need to do, when you do it, and who do you do it with to make it work for you. Number four, invest in your sweet spots. How good are you at spending the vast majority of your time doing things that you love to do and are good at? So in this chart here, there's stuff you love, stuff you're good at, and stuff that people will pay you to do. You know, if you're a master violin player, but there's no demand for it in your company, then that's not what we're talking about. So that would be a sweet spot in your life. But at work, you know, a lot of people fall into this mistaken belief that they should have to shoehorn themselves into a role and be like a square peg in a round hole. That's not sustainable. If you want to play at the highest level, you have to have a role that naturally suits you in a way that works for you. So how, how much of your time do you spend in that sweet spot? My, my challenge to you is to get to 80%, maybe 70 but a majority of your time where you do the best work and it gives you back energy so that you can sustain that. Five, lick your toads. This is a fun one. It, uh, it seems like a simple principle and not a big deal, yet I have seen this principle take down grown men and women. It's actually unbelievable. So toads are, are these, these little annoying things that you put off and avoid. Um, the, the story of it is if I told you we had this great, big, slimy, smelly, fresh out of the ditch toad, just like the one on the screen. And I told you, hey, you're going to have to lick this thing from the tip of its tail, across its back, across under its slimy chin, through its belly, through its other special places. And you're going to have to lick this thing by the end of the year. Most people are going to wait till the end of the year. And, and as they avoid it, it's, they're going to think about it a ton. It's going to follow them around. They're going to have nightmares. It's going to make them anxious. It's probably going to collect some friends and end up with more of these things that they're putting off and avoiding dealing with until finally they've got 50 of these toads layered up on them, like 50 kilograms on their shoulders, weighing them down. And they wonder why they feel horrible and are stressed and anxious. And then midnight comes and then they lick this stupid thing. And as soon as they're done, they're all going to say the same thing. You're going to say the same thing. I'd say the same thing. Oh, wow. That wasn't as bad as I thought. Always. And then two, why did I wait so long? So we all have these toads, these things that we put off, and they seem inconsequential compared to the big strategic things we have at work or our high priorities in our life. But they weigh us down and, and, and burden the back of our minds. So how do you rate in making sure annoying little things get done before they pile up? And by the way, in a chapter you'll see, the solution is not just to do them. Usually, if that was a solution, it would have already worked. You often need to delegate them or throw them back, and there's, there's five Ds to deal with. So how good are you dealing with these annoying little things? Six, deal with your emotional junk. How good are you at not responding irrationally or emotionally in tense situations? I will tell you, as leaders grow in organizations, this is one of the things that stops people's growth. If you can't learn how to master your own emotions, 
you can't get to the highest levels in most companies. Or if you're the owner or the CEO, your own growth gets stunted along the way because you can't engage the bright, high-powered people that you need to be successful. So in this chapter, we get into understanding these things. Sometimes it means going to a, a psychologist or a therapist and getting the junk out of your system because we all build up a lot of junk or baggage along the way. Sometimes it's having workarounds or ways to work around this. Um, this is one that a lot of people don't like to do. Uh, I will tell you, if you look at the really high-performing leaders, they won't tell you when you meet them. But as a coach, I know many of them have done a lot of work in this area so they can keep evolving and, and growing. Uh, seven, manage your mental health. How skilled are you at managing your mental health? Look, man mental health is a whole other world. And no matter what, my, my belief is, and you know, if you look at studies, at any given time, more than 90% of executives feel quite stressed. Uh, and, and close to uh, two thirds, very stressed. So mental health is something that shocks me and surprises me all the time. But all of us are gonna have mental health issues. Many of us right now are having mental health issues. There's something called the mental health continuum, I'll share with you in a, in a minute, that walks through and shows you how to self-assess on this. Uh, it's very important, but just know, we're all gonna have the issues. We just need to be prepared and have people to help us when it does get weird. And it'll get weird at times you do not expect. So how skilled are you at managing it from the past or prepared for the future? Uh, learn like your life depends on it. You know, as you know, those of you that know me well, know that this is a big thing. I love to learn because it makes me better at my job. It's not entertainment for me. But it's really about lifelong learning and a lot of people get into the middle age of their career and they stop learning and they use what worked 10 years ago. But the business has changed or the market's changed and they're dragging themselves to success It doesn't work. So how do you, how do you rate as a lifelong learner and continually getting smarter and more capable? My belief too is in your work and in other things that interest you. Nine, get tough feedback. How do you rate it getting honest opinions about your performance? Again, most people shy away from it, but it makes us more fragile as we grow and if you continually get that tough feedback, although your ego doesn't like it, it actually makes you way more successful. Uh, we usually just need mechanisms for it. Make yourself useless, one of my favorite chapters. How good are you building a team so strong there's not much you need to do? And in theory, you could have your feet in the desk. Not a great idea, you'd probably offend quite a few people, but, uh, and not set a great role, be a great role model. But the idea is high-performing leaders build a really, really strong team that is so good, they just facilitate support and, and give them the resources they need. Uh, underperforming leaders often are trying to be the rock star themselves, and they put up with a very weak team, which burdens them and makes them have to work a lot of hours. And I, I remember a quote from Henry Ford that I saw many, many years ago. He says, any man, and he only talked about men back then, any man who has to work more than 40 hours a week is incompetent. And what he was really referring to is, is that you need to be master of delegating and getting other people to do the most of the work so that you can lead. So that's what this chapter is about, and it's about being really clear on the quality and caliber of people that you need to have on your team, and it's about not tolerating any mediocrity or maybe one or two people that will be mediocre on a, on a team of you know, 12 to 15 that's in the top couple layers of company. Quadruple your IQ, or what I call 14X advisors. How good are you at leveraging the insights and opinions from real experts, which I call 14X advisors in business and in life? A 14X advisor is someone who has solved your problem or been in your situation 14 times before. So if you're draft, drafting a licensing agreement with a company in South America, you want the lawyer who has done 14 of those agreements, not your buddy who, who normally does business law in Canada. You're not going to get the right contract. So no matter what it is, how do you leverage experts that have been there and done that? Just make sure they're not stale. Uh, and we got an example here on the top one is the board of GE. This is a few years ago. And, and, and on the bottom is Airbnb. So, you know, they don't have to all be, you know, stuffy looking in suits. But it's which, you know, which kind of experts do you need in different areas? For a lot of us, we could use experts from the gray hair suit guys and gals who have a huge amount of experience. And you know, from the hipster tech companies, we could use some help from them because they offer different insights. The key is, do you have the absolute best advisors? You know, and I recommend there's probably a list of 20 to 30 of them you need at least if you're gonna play a big game. Stop being chief problem solver. 
Again, for a lot of us, we are in our positions because we know stuff and because we know answers and because we're one of those 14X advisors to the people around us. But if we keep answering their questions, they're always gonna depend on us. It makes us feel good, but then it burdens us down with too much. So how skilled are you in helping people to become strong, independent leaders? And in this one, is getting people to answer 90% of their own questions, 90%. Uh, uh, this amazing CEO I work with uh, down in, down in, in, in the US, um, his thing is he actually doesn't want to tell people what to do. And actually many of the best CEOs I work with are the same way. They don't want to tell people what to do. They want people to find their own way and make their own decisions. Otherwise, it's the CEO's idea trying to get pushed through the organization versus the executive owning it and make it happen. So how good are you at getting people to answer almost all of their questions on their own? 13, teach people to meet your standards. In this one, high performing leaders are, are that way because they have very high standards. And whether it's standard of the quality of the deals that you figure out to make them profitable, or it's standards of how you operate a store, or train people, or quality of R&D, or how well the environment is held, or the quality of people you allow to be hired. Almost all high performers have very high standards. That's why they're in charge. The key is to be gracious about it. And people will go into two camps. They will say nothing and tolerate stuff that doesn't meet their standard because they don't like the tension. Or um, they will be actually rude or just lash out at people. Neither is really ideal. So how skilled are you are graciously getting people to meet those standards? And you should be proud of them. Tackle tough conversations. Imagine if you had to give feedback to this guy. <laughs> if he was tied up, I might. But, you know, how skilled are you are quickly giving tough feedback? You know, for a lot of people, we have feedback. And with CEOs I work with, again and again and again, contrary to popular belief, a lot of the best CEOs are not ruthless when it comes to people. They actually care and are respectful and want to be nice to them. So sometimes giving this tough feedback is very tough. I, I always have a list of CEOs that are supposed to be giving feedback to people and I follow up on it to make sure it happens because I know how hard it is for them. In this chapter is a simple four step model um, which allows you to give the toughest feedback gracefully and almost guarantee if you do it right, not having a negative reaction. It breaks it down into four steps, fact based, really, really simple. Love the lessons. How good are you at seeing the benefit in your biggest challenges at work and life? And this is the hard part. You know, for a lot of people, we, we get punished like this on a regular basis. So, and sometimes it's like Tyson's throwing that punch and, and you feel like you got knocked out. But if we don't love the lesson and see what's good about it, we'll stay in this victim mode and pain mode where we don't learn and get stronger. So what we need to be able to do is to see what's good in that and instead of you know, being you know, uh, the glass half empty, go to the glass half full and how is this good for us? There's a bunch of techniques and tools I talk about in this chapter. It is one of the most important things because business and success is just a mind game. It's all mental. And this is about managing your story and how do you manage your stories and, and teach your people to manage theirs. Fortunately in our world, people love the woe is me story. People love the, oh, I was done wrong and this isn't fair and everything else. Truth is, suck it up, buttercup. You want to get on with it and do something with it. And it's not about the luck that you have or the cards you dealt, the cards you're dealt, it's about how you play them. But all of us, including myself, sometimes get stuck in that mode where we're not jumping on it and pushing ahead. Keep going for it. It's inspired by, inspired by my grandmother, um, Betty Howitt, who at 81 years old went back to university. Yes, at 81 years old, she was, a, she was an amazing, amazing woman, you know, crazy in her own special way. But the point is, I see a lot of leaders and executives that get very comfortable. And again, this goes back to our ego. We get really comfortable in a certain place in that comfort zone. And we stay there too much and we start to get fragile. So this is just about continuing to stretch yourself. And it's not just at work. It, it, it can be. You know, lots of us take risks and stretch ourselves at work and you need to do that. You know, in my case, even I've had a coaching practice for 20 something years. My phone rings constantly with people who want help. I could easily do that the rest of my life, but my concern is I would get stale. And you know, my next challenge is to go speak and impact a lot more people. I, I need to do it. There's still a little part of me that resisted because it's, it's outside my natural comfort zone. So for this, it can be about hobbies or sports 
or learning or anything that kind of continues to stretch you and keeps you learning and keeps you, you know, putting yourself in positions where you not, might not be the man or the woman or the superhero, but maybe you're the learner or the student so that you keep fresh and keep moving ahead. Um, and so basically, instead of having the bucket list, it's a stretch list. Things that will continue to stretch your spirit and your soul and, and keep you alive and fresh. And then finally, plan, plan, and plan again. And the principle here is, all this theory is great. All these principles work. But most of us in business are successful because of goal setting and plans. And in our lives, to some extent, we might have that. For ourselves, most people are very, very weak. So this is about how disciplined are you about planning and regularly replanning for work, self, and life. Uh, there's, a, there's a tool in this chapter called the master plan, which really on a page integrates all those three areas into one. So you can have one master plan where they all you know, cross-pollinate and, and help each other uh, and take into account how much energy you want to ded dedicate to each. I'll show that in a second. So if we go through and connect your dots, if you did it online, you'll already see it. And, and if you're doing it on, it did it on the paper version, you'll obviously be able, to be able to take a look at it. The idea here is to look at those examples, or your example, and say, hey, it's not about fixing the lowest one. That, that is not the name of the game. It might be taking the highest one and making it stronger. So the question for you to consider, consider is what's the number one that will make you stronger and more effective right now? So just take a second and make a note. Which one of those habits would have the biggest ROI or impact on you today? Which would have the biggest ROI or impact? Take a look at the screen and make a note. So I already mentioned up front, the workbook is available. You can download the free copy or you can get the um, version on Amazon. The book and the audio book are also available, whatever format works for you. If you need bulk versions to, to share with your team or people in your company, you know, a bunch of companies are taking it and reading uh, a chapter a week on, on, on Teams, which seems to work for them. But anyways, if, if you want um, bulk purchase or anything, you can contact Janice who registered with you. So on the plan, plan, plan again, the idea is to have a simple, all-encompassing, ever-evolving, one-page master plan for your work, self, and life. And I made it as simple as I can. Basically, there's an annual review and then the master plan. And the review is just purely reflection. Sit by yourself on a rock or on a bench or at your desk and review how did I do over the last year. And you see these percent questions. It's about your passion ratios or percent of oxygen that you allocated in each of those areas. And all the plans are always about resetting that. How much of my oxygen or best energy did I put in each of those areas? And then on the master plan, the top is just your values, your sweet spot, and what you won't do or tolerate. And then just long term, three years and a year, what you want to achieve. Again, starting with how much of that oxygen do you want to allocate to each area? It's not rocket science. It's a really valuable thing to do, and it's even better to do with your family and sit down and do it. What some people are doing is I'm putting a dotted line down the self column so that one side is for the spouse and one side is for yourself. And then the same thing on a quarter, every 90 days. You know, those of you that use Scaling Up or, or Rockefeller Habits will know the same type of thinking. It's just planning, but it integrates it into one spot. Same thing on a quarterly version, every 90 days. So at the end of June, go back and look. Just a reflection. And then replanning the quarter. How much of your, your passion or your, your oxygen do you want to allocate in each category? And the number one project in each. There's also a spot in here for you to note the habit you want to start or stop and to list your totes. Again, it's not rocket science, but it is a discipline that works. So I am going to just talk about one principle and we'll make sure that we're finished on time and it's double your resilience. It's the one I mentioned up front that most people need to work on. So a good half the art of resilience, a good half the art of living is resilience and it's knowing how to make yourself stronger. My belief is my life gets better as I get stronger. So you need to work on this if. If you often run out of energy, feel tired, or get sick. If you get sick more than once per year, you need to work on this. And I'm even talking just a cold. Uh, you're not enjoying the challenges or enjoying the wins at work. You regularly allow other people's priorities to bump the things you want to do for yourself and your own wellness. You stop doing the things that bring you reward and inspiration. 
Maybe you don't even know what they are. And you feel the need to escape from your work and life. It's just, it's just, it's just not working for it. Those are kind of the extremes that, that indicate you should probably pay attention. And when you stay true to what I call your resilience rituals, you just set yourself up to win because you're stronger going forward. So we talked about this in terms of body, mind, and spirit. And sorry, I'll go back here. Body, mind, and spirit. So what I have you do, just make a note for a moment. Now, maybe these things you're already doing. Maybe they're things that you did in the past. I don't know. But I'd like to have you make a note of, of two things in each category that, will, that you either do or should do in terms of making your body stronger, your mind stronger, and your spirit stronger. So just take a second and make a note. So two things for your body. What do you do or should you do? Maybe you've done it in the past. There's obviously exercises in the book to help you get deeper. For your mind and your spirit. So to give you an example, right now, my, my focus on body is making sure I work out at least five times a week. And it's either workout or yoga. Yoga just so helps fix my body and my posture, which has been amazing recently. And eating as healthy as I can, meaning eating a lot more vegetables and a lot less processed stuff. Um, for my mind, it's writing, journaling, and trying to find time to get to walk in nature. I, I'm still working on that one, not, not quite as good as I want to be, or at least to be in nature. Uh, and then spirit. And for me, it's time playing with my kids, and it's playing at the racetrack, which is one of the passions that, that brings a lot, a lot of joy to me, um, which I'm, I'm doing pretty well on that one. So I'd like you to think about this. You know, what do you need to do or stop around resilience rituals? Right? Simple principle, a lot more depth in the book. And then who on your team needs to master this? This is not just about yourself, but who on your team also would need to master these resilience rituals and likely could, could be much better off if they did. You know, remember the book is meant to read the overall part, you know, the first section of the book, and then go and work on one of these habits at a time. If you work on them all at once, you'll, you'll mess yourself up. So picking one at a time. If you haven't mastered this, and if people on your team haven't, I would suggest this is the most important place to start from my view, unless you're in some sort of other crisis. I'm just gonna skip on to the, the mental health one here, and I wanna share with you one thing. Um, I'm just, all of us are one or two life events away from developing a mental health issue. It's basically like being in the ring with Tyson. If he misses us, we might take one punch, might. Two punches, we're in deep, deep trouble. Even if you're a professional fighter, a couple fight punches from Tyson, you're in deep trouble. Three, you're, you're in serious trouble. So the kind of events that really throw people, and I see with executives often, job loss, loss of a career dream, death of somebody, miscarriage, abuse, sickness or injury, uh, sickness or injury of a loved one, a relationship ending, a key support person moving out of their life, financial loss, conflicts, lawsuit, making big mistakes for people that really care. A new boss, loss of a pet, kids leaving home, Christmas, moving, all of those things can really throw people off. The key is, and on most of these, I, I, I've seen a very high performer because of a miscarriage, the husband went into a deep, dark place, all kinds of stuff. The point is, these are predictable situations that strain us and get us into trouble. The model I want you to see, and the model you have a responsibility as a leader to know, is this model called the mental health continuum. And it helps you understand whether you're healthy, reacting, injured, or ill. So green is normal. Yellow, yeah, you're a little messed up. Orange, you're in trouble and you should probably be seeing an expert. Red, you're in deep, deep, deep trouble because after red means you're one of the first people I talked about on my slides. And that's not good. So interesting point is that for most high performers that I work with, swing between these and for myself many many times i've been in the orange and on the on the uh the verge of red uh thankfully i've never got to the very end of red uh, although i know many many people who have and they've shared with me individually but it's normal to move around the key is when someone is in orange and red we cannot help them the only help that works for them is a mental health professional the only help that works for them is the mental health professional. If I have a compound fracture on my leg, you're not gonna to try to fix it, you're gonna call 911. And same thing when people start getting into orange and red, the only thing that can help them is a psychologist, period. 
And that's my number one thing I do when people are in that state. Yellow, we can work on it. A little bit of orange, fine. But when you're in that red, for sure, you need pro help and orange potentially as well. The key I want you to get is you're not the person to help. You're just a facilitator or a bridge to get him to an expert. That's all that we can do because this is way beyond our skill level and our pay grades. So the point is have a backup plan and I have a plan and a backup plan, sorry, for managing your mind because it is going to get weird. And, and one of the things I'd have you think about is you should have a psychologist, a, a text message away or a phone call or an appointment away. Because if it, even if it's not for yourself, it'll be for other people around you. And it can be hard to find good ones, but you can find them if you ask around uh, through people you know, through your professional network. Uh, sometimes high-end health clinics will know them for sure or, or doctors will also know them. So how do you think about this one? What do you need to do or stop around mental health? And who on your team might need some help with this? Sharing this mental health continuum is a very easy, graceful way to put it in front of them. Uh, we know the resilience rituals, SMS. And then the final thing I'd say when you think about people in your life, who might you need a coffee with? Who might need a coffee this week? It was funny, this picture I pulled up of Anthony Bourdain, is he's got a coffee cup sitting there. And one of the things I talk about is a coffee talk. You know, I have learned the people in my network, now that they know that I'm being very open about, you know, the stuff in, in your oxygen mask and mental health, a lot more things are coming to me. And a lot more people are saying, hey, man, I'd love to talk to you. Quite a few. And usually the, nothing comes up in the first bit. But it'll be near the end of the conversation, people will come out and say, hey, by the way, there was one more thing. Or, you know, I got another question I'd like to ask you another time. You just got to create space for the stuff to come out. Uh, my book is a great way to bring it out and that mental health continuum. But either way, who do you think might need a bit of a longer chat to talk about what's really going on? I'm going to skip through this. One sec here. So in summary, you know, Elvis was an amazing rock star, but, but that, that, that dichotomy of success got him and lots of those other high performers. When really, although they had it all, it destroyed them, and then they, choose, they chose that this just was too much for them to bear or it wasn't, you know, life wasn't worth living, which is obviously very, very unfortunate. And I'm not just worried about people ending their lives. I'm just worried about people giving up on their careers or giving up on their dreams. But deep down inside, the, the challenge is, is because these people are high performers and so committed, sometimes their capability doesn't match it. This book is about increasing the capability so they can take on more and keep getting better and better. And, but in order for that to work, people have to, including myself and you, put our own oxygen masks on first so that we can be stronger and more resilient so that we have more to give to people. And how do we put our mask on first? By putting time and energy into mastering these different habits that make us stronger, not just armor type stronger, but truly stronger inside and able to handle a lot more stress pressure. And if, if, the, if the leaders can't scale, the business won't grow, we know. Work-life balance is bullshit. You got to put yourself first and figure out how much energy you want to allocate to yourself. That's usually for most 10 or 15% of their best energy or their best oxygen. And as we talked about, you got to put your growth first and your health first and your learning and your think time and your inspiration and your strength and your oxygen mask. And have that one page plan where you continue to keep dialing it in. We're, we're a living organism. It's always going to be a little bit weird and out of balance. We got to find ways to clean it up. Recommend that you do your master plan and that every quarter, if you're on my list, you'll get updates and prompts to do the quarterly plan as well. As we talked about mastering one habit at a time, and I recommend you share your insights. As I said up front, the assessment is free. It'll always be free unless we do some advanced version, but it'll always be free. Get the people on your team to do the assessment. Talk about those principles with them in your one-on-one -on -one coaching when you talk about what they need to do to get stronger. The good news is, is that if you picked one of those habits, like make yourself useless, there's a video they can go watch. There's the exercises and the workbooks, all kinds of resources. I'll obviously keep adding with it, but use it, share it. I'm, I'm happy to give this stuff away to as many people as I can. So finally, in the last two minutes, talk is cheap. Or last one minute, talk is cheap. I'd like you to write down one or two things you're going to do based on this webinar. One is for yourself, and then one is for somebody else on your team or in your life. Take a second, two things, one for you, one for someone else. Okay, final quote, Mr. Steve Jobs. My, no, my job is not to be easy on people, my job is to make them better. And take these great people we have, 
which would be you and others, and push them, making them come up with even more aggressive visions of how it could be. And that's a thought I'd like to leave you with. Life is grand. Life is beautiful. Life should continue to get better and better, and, and so should our work. But we have to keep pushing ourselves and others to stretch and get stronger at the same time. So thanks for your time today. Uh, I'll hang around if there's any other questions. And if there is, um, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, uh, enjoy your day. And remember to keep your oxygen mask on first so you keep getting stronger and, and then you have more to give. All the best.